Thanks. Okay, I think being the last speaker and also one of the co-organizers for this event, I don't think I can proceed before I can have the honor to welcome the entire organizing team for UXC 2018. The smiles on your faces and the feedback that we have received really brings so much joy and it humbles us to a point where you will not know. And you have all made this event a huge success, so in no particular order, let's cheer for Angeline, Marcus, Jay, Ruchi, Abhinav, Atima, Joanna, Nizo, Enhao, Nugan, Dorothy. Some of the volunteers are not with us today. Catherine, Christy, Wenchi, Vibha, Nicole, Jasmine. Let's keep the cheer up, guys. Chelsea, Anu, Ashish, Joanna, Sulab, Soumya, our MCs Ha and Priscilla, Kuldeep, and finally me. It has taken us eight months of meeting and hard work to bring this event to you. So I think all our volunteers and organizing committee deserves a huge round of applause and whistles. And I would also like to thank our sponsors, SP Group, Lazada, Firemark, and our in-kind sponsors, Sketch, Rosenfield, and Azure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, where is uh, Yoel? Is he here in the room? I counted his weed counter. It stands at eight. Let's see if he can break that record in his next talk. <laughs> yeah, so it's very hard to uh, follow up a presentation like that. So fucked up, shit, and weed. I will not use any of those words. It will be a kid-friendly presentation. Okay. Uh, that's my mom. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but she is indeed a melodramatic Indian lady. That's my dad. A really doting Indian father. So from a very young age, this was me. <laughs> I, I can do the step, but... So from a very young age, I knew that negoci negotiation and balancing different perspectives is going to be a trait that I will cherish when I grow old. And it did happen. I was constantly thinking, huh? What, what, what is this person saying and what are you saying? And I was always bringing perspectives when people were not talking. So I was like, just get in a room and talk. And that is predominantly my childhood. So I'm a UX unicorn. I basically got into this field after a huge dilemma of quitting academic. Uh, my background is uh, in computer sciences and information systems, so it's pretty hardcore. And after finishing my uh, program, I was thinking, hmm, academic, be, I mean, I have to stay true to that persona. It's just something that grows on you. It's very hard to let go. But I also wanted to solve, like, really challenging problems. And academic has a very different approach to solving problems. And I thought the way I am and the way I'm wired, I would like to take up the challenge. So I joined a startup, Money Smart, if you don't know already. Um, and I think it has been a good, good, good experience so far. So let's see. The topic of my presentation is how to kickstart a research culture in an organization that has none. Can I have a quick show of hands, people who are interested in UX research? Whoa. And how many of you are presently into UX research? So you either hold the position of UX researcher. I was not expecting that. Okay. And we've also had quite a bit of talks this year on UX research, which is really encouraging because I think a huge part um, in, in making design successful is effective research, right? Um, so I'm really happy that there's such participation from UX researchers this year as well. So 90 day program, and this is from a, like my life. So first 30 days, don't do anything. <laughs> Easy, right? So 30 days out of 90 days gone, one third of your job is already done. <laughs> Just kidding. You have to do something, be patient. You know, start by asking questions. Um, you can ask questions from senior management. You can ask questions from your team members. You can even get feedback from uh, people that you think are seemingly unrelated to your job. Could be the commercial guys, could be the sales department, could be marketing. Um, I thought that the sales and, market, uh, sales and commercial team was the most wo warm and like all of them were so fuzzy when I came in and they welcomed me with open arms and that was a huge plus point for me because it was a validation of uh, a strong culture, right? Um, so yeah, be patient, start by collecting questions and figure out what you want to do. You cannot do everything, so figure out what you're good at, find your niche and start building a strategy. Um, on that note, building a strategy is step two. 
find UX tenets you actually believe in, right? I, I hear a lot of um, noise on users first. I care about my users. Damn you, user! No. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of people say users first, but what they mean is users eventually. And that's a sad story, right? There's a lot of head nodding, but when it comes to actually taking strong decisions um, for our users, many of us shy away because it is the harder road. It will take time and it takes effort. Um, so what are some of the UX tenets that you can consider? You can either s just simply agree that I am user-centric until I feel that this is going to bring any uh, value proposition to my users. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to participate. I mean, you can't really say that, but... You can say, tell it to yourself that I believe in being user-centric. Or you can say, I have no biases. I will just focus on what the research says. Either existing research, research that has already been done. There's a great set of material that you can find. And I think that's a benefit that I got being into academic, that I really became research-focused. So I would devour papers. I would devour articles, um, go on conference websites where they actually have all the presentations loaded, and just listen to them for like six hours straight. I just attended a conference without paying a dollar. But what it does is that it further validates that I just want to be research-focused, right? Or you can say, I believe in numbers. Numbers is where I shine. Numbers. Okay, I'm going to collect the data, existing data or new data, that's up to you, whatever you can get hands on, but data is what is going to drive me. Or you can be design-led. You can say that, I don't care what the research says, I don't care if it's going to bring value proposition, I'll just design it and I'll test it. Okay, so find a tenet or a set of tenets that you believe in and then actually work on them. Um, and one point for that is that Never think that research works in silos. You will just be that person that gets used and abused on small projects and small asks, and then nobody cares, right? And it was like, I just wanted data for that question. Go away. Shoo. Um, <laughs> so if you don't want that to happen to you, make sure that you're always advocating for the bigger picture. Be the CQO of your company. Anybody knows what CQ is? CQO is? See, that's a C-suite level position that I just created and all of you can be CQOs. <laughs> Perfect, can you say that online? Chief question officer. Yay. Chief question officer. Just ask why. But please don't be annoying because after a while it can get really annoying. Like, why, why, why this, why that? Um, like, find your groove, find your, find your rhythm and then just ask, why are you doing this? What is it going to do? What's the bigger picture? How is this going to help me one year down the line? I'm not going to, you know, get the momentum going until I understand the bigger picture. These are some of the ways you can justify to that stakeholder why I should be putting this effort in. So be the CQO. And you can also validate your UX tenets along the way, right? Things that you believe in and things that are actually worth believing in. So let's take a case study because this is a kind of a crash course. A sample problem, someone comes to me and says, we don't know enough about our users, right? That's a big problem. And often people will state it that way because they really don't know what aspect of knowing my user am I interested in. They'll just come and say like, we don't know enough about our users. But that's where your CQO kicks in. It's like, why do you want to know your users? What is it about your users that you want to know? Just, just be a mad like, detective, just ask the, ask the whys, right? It can just not be wise, it can be hows, it can be which, it can be what. Just, just ask them, what's the bigger picture, what's the bigger question? Um, so one of our products at Money Smart is home loans. We help people get home loans faster, more seamless, uh, painlessly, right? So some of the questions which came from that meta question of, we don't know enough about our users, when probed further, they led to questions like, who are our first time versus repeat? homeowners, right? People buying home for the first time, people buying home for the second time. So already the distinction has happened because the user behavior may not be the same. The things that they value may not be the same. One needs more information, the other one needs more um, actionable steps, right? So that distinction can happen if you start probing the question. What do they value, right? Is it just discount? Is it just the best price? If it's just the best price, it's easy. Right? But your job as a researcher is to figure out, apart from price, apart from that obvious factor, what is driving them? What's their, what's their pain point? What's the actual need that we have to serve here? 
apart from promos, discounts, and price. Sorry, Yoel. Is Yoel here? I feel like I had like lots of references for him. I want to throw it at him, but I think he's just left. Um, when do they think, think? When do they begin thinking about buying a home? So where does the actual journey start? Remember, the meta question didn't answer or point you in any of these directions. So these are all individual projects that you can work on. And then you go back to your tenets, see what you believe in, and then apply those tenets here. Where do, you, where do they typically look for a home? Online, offline? So how, I know Catherine just had a wonderful discussion on the property sector, and agents are huge in Singapore, right? And we always take the path of um, least energy, so it's easy to call agents and like, hey, I'm looking for a house in this particular area, can you help me? Rather than looking for all the information digitally. Um, if they haven't found a home yet, how can we help them understand eligibility? Right? What are their concerns? All they want to know is, can I even afford a home? Is it even rational for me to think of getting a home? Am I being stupid? Sometimes they just need a yes or a no. Right? Um, so probing helps you get to that particular direction that you can then pursue. So what you will then have is an overarching strategy. So my overarching strategy um, is turn business considerations into customer and customer insights, into a user-centric strategy and design execution. So I've highlighted the main bold points. Business, insights, user-centric strategy, and design. And they follow in that order because I firmly believe that if I am empathetic to my users, I also need to be empathetic to my business. I will not survive longer in this profession if I'm not empathetic to my business. So I keep that as one of my tenets, right? And I don't mince around with that. I'm, I'm honest and true about it. So two steps so far. Does anyone remember what the two steps were? Actually, even I forgot. Let's recap. No, I'm just kidding. Step one, be patient. Ask questions. Step two, find the tenets that you believe in. Step three, create a toolkit that works for you. I see a lot of new budding UX researchers when they come to me and say, hey, can you mentor me? Um, you know, I, I really want to get into UX research. What are the techniques that I should learn? I'm really good at surveys or I'm really good at interviews. And I'm like, try not to bucket yourself in the beginning before you've tried a couple of other methodologies. So don't knock it until you try it. Um, so try methodologies that have a design focus or testing focus or research focus or quality assurance focus. Try all various techniques and see where you are good at. And as someone rightly pointed out during the summit, if you don't do a thing for 10,000 hours, you're not going to get, be an expert in it. So you really need to meddle with a technique for a long period of time before you can really feel like you get a hang of it. So I've been doing research for close to seven years now, but I still learn every day that I'm, I can get better at face-to-face -face interviews. I can get better at designing that survey questionnaire, right? The learning never stops. Um, an example of a toolkit for me, for example, going back to that home loans problem was, um, what again, probing and then figuring out what do I want to focus on. Um, it can be the which, what, how, why, and then I choose the methodology um, accordingly. But what I do in principle, and it has worked so far for me, is that I attack the problem always from multiple directions. I never go for one direction. So while the surveys can tell me what, uh, desirability testing where we basically just give the users a bunch of options and ask and see and observe sometimes which option do they go for or it can be a guided usability testing where we help them achieve that task basically we're trying to find out what is more desirable to them right and the third approach is a customer journey mapping so customer journey mapping is an end-to-end -end process which tells you where does the process where does your users journey start and where does it end and what happens in between so you can see these three techniques really work well together because they attack the problem from complementary uh, perspectives. So to get here took me about three or four years of trying a lot of methodologies, right? And doing them over and over and over again. Another uh, good uh, technique in the toolkit could be an empathy map. Does anyone know what an empathy map is? Okay, good. Can anyone explain what an empathy map is to this? Wonderful audience. <laughs> I have my prey. You want to go? Yeah. <laughs> I think an empathy map gets you into what your consumers say, think, feel, and do so that you can start to walk a day in their shoes. Yeah. 
I like that part. It helps you to walk it in your shoes. A technique is a technique, but what it actually helps you to do is far greater than the rules that the technique brings. So an empathy map essentially gives you a two by two matrix of um, arranging your user's feedback into think, feel, say, do. Um, so for example, the user is thinking, oh, what a great experience. I love it. I can't wait to get back on this website. But what they're feeling is, oh, but maybe I can just talk to someone if they have a problem, I mean. Uh, what they're saying is, yes, I'm ready to go digital. I'm ready to take all my financial decisions online with minimum human intervention. But what they're doing is they're still not buying from those full digital services and products. So there's definitely a mismatch happening, right? So that's why empathy is a really great toolkit. So what I would recommend, one tip that you want, is go 30,000 feet up, figure out one or two techniques for looking at problems 30,000, and then figure out what that one technique is that really helps you get into the deep dive of the problem. And keep doing that alternatively. Do like a couple of uh, really intense customer interviews, collect data, synthesize them, break them into um, chunks, slice it, dice it according to whatever you're looking for, and then come back 30,000 view and then create, um, uh, use a technique that's like really gives you that upper picture. Could be an empathy map, could be a customer journey mapping, could be an experience map. There's like tons of techniques out there. And keep rotating between these two perspectives. You'll be amazed at how much you get influenced by biases and your own beliefs and values. Right? And what you have to essentially train is to leave those biases out of the door when you walk into the door of that interview room. Right? Leave your biases outside. Just have fun. I mean, I think sometimes we just take things too seriously. Of course, and as a researcher, I'm a researcher, but I tend to have a lot of fun at work. Right? We have a great culture at Money Smart, and we encourage um, us to enjoy we're, we're spending like nine close to nine to ten hours every day how can you be at a place if you don't enjoy it right you're gonna get burned out so have fun along the journey uh, I really like this quote because it kind of sums it up what I've spoken so far a good user experience like a measurable ROI everyone knows ROI return on investment doesn't typically happen by accident it's a result of careful planning analysis investment and continuous improvement right step four so we're almost done. I will actually wrap up much sooner because, oh, Yoel is in the house. Did you know your weed counter is at seven? Like the number of times you said weed during your talk? Try breaking that counter next time. Okay. Step four, dollar, dollar bills, y'all. I mean, that's essentially what the business is going to run on. Um, again, be true. What do you believe in? You want to believe in ROI or you want to believe in customer satisfaction or there's another matrix that you truly believe in. Just focus on that. I mean, of course, keep your job. You, you need, guys, you need to contribute to that ROI. <laughs> okay. Self-philosophical. Um, but you can always be honest that customer satisfaction is what I ultimately care about. That's where, that's where I am. That's where I shine, right? And then your, you will see that your research initiatives will start wiggling in that direction or be skewed in that direction, but it will give you a, a, a true identity as a researcher. And I think it's really important because long after UI is dead, something that I heard in this conference, the UI is dead. <laughs> um, your, your, you, well, who you are will still stay, right? So be true, try to be true to yourself. So it's either ROI or, or customer satisfaction or NPS or whatever you want to believe in, just focus on that. And get, it, get ready to be humbled. A lot of user research, I feel, comes whacking in my face where I thought this is what the user needed. And ultimately, what happened was that it was nowhere close to what my user needed. I thought they're going to click A, and then click B, and then click C, and they just look at it for like 10 minutes. Like, that's, it's right there. Just, it's, it's there. Just click it. Start your journey, because that's what I made the customer journey map for. But they don't start the process. I don't know what's going on in their brain. Right? Um, and user feedback is wonderful because it gives you area, for Im area of improvement. And what users struggle with and what you think they struggle with are vastly different. I'll give you an example. Credit cards. How many of us have credit cards? Okay, how many of, okay, how many of you have credit card? Hands up. How many of you have more than two credit cards? How many of you have more than four credit cards? How many of you have more than 10 credit cards? Yes, you, ooh, can you just stand up? We want a chair for you. It's like, you are my user right there. 
I need to do an interview with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, what users are struggling with is not whether I should go for credit card A or B. Actually, what they are struggling with is com what I call the competing parameter phenomenon. So in product, what happens is that some products have a direct, um, param uh, direct price parameter that you compare around. This is cheaper, this is expensive, go for the cheaper, done, decision done. But for some products, the parameters are competing. They're competing against each other. So higher cash back or minimum spend or maximum miles or maximum rewards. It's like, ooh, like what do I compare with what? So it's the competing factors phenomena that make some products really complex. And so they are struggling actually with that. And who is aware that there's a group called Miles Lion on Telegram, which is basically just having these kind of conversations. So there's an exclusive group on Telegram where users, like actual Singapore local users, are helping each other navigate this competing problem phenomena. Right? They're not going digital, they're not going to forums, they're not going to um, websites, like comparison websites, they're going to social media like Telegram and having this closed group conversation. Um, and if you don't focus on these things, they are going to switch, especially when the cost of switch is one click. So essentially it costs them zero dollars to switch, so they will switch. Step five, balance, always, mm. okay, you have to balance your ROI with your customer satisfaction, try, try to balance it out, it's difficult, uh, but that's where there is room for growth, as, as, as someone who wants to evolve in their field, in their craft, you have to learn how to balance these two perspectives, almost there, almost there, figure out an internal NPS. So everyone knows what an NPS is, Net Promoter Score. Who will tell me what NPS is? Quick one-liner. NPS, NPS, NPS. Yes. It's in essence, how likely the person is to recommend your product, but people use it um, for customer satisfaction as well. Yes. Thank you for saying that. Even though it's just supposed to hint towards a recommendation propensity, people often substitute it for customer satisfaction. NPS is not customer satisfaction, right? So figure out what you want to measure. Um, so that's on the customer side, but actually this slide was more internal NPS. How likely are your teammates to refer a UX research activity within your own team, right? So you can have a quick survey saying, I think the UX research initiatives are easy to understand and put to action. So you just share it with your team members and they're going to say on a scale of one to five. You have some measurement of how well are you doing? Are you understanding their problems? Are you giving them the results that are useful for them? You're not creating reports that nobody is going to use, right? You're giving them the results in a format that's easy to digest for them. Or based on your experience, how likely are you to recommend UX research initiatives to a colleague? So that's an internal NPS, a true NPS. Um, so yeah, that's one way. Step seven, get people excited. I mean, um, as a research team of one, um, I have kind of implanted in the team ways for them to get pumped up about research. So I have just put up like a research wall of fame and started creepily taking Polaroid pictures of people in my, in my office. And every time they hear that, that sound that the Polaroid camera makes, they're like, oh, her again. <laughs> But I, I do take random photos of people and I will put it up. And what's going to happen is I don't stop at that. So I actually give them, does this work? Okay, bad UX, yes. Uh, I give them stamps for every time they do a UX research activity with me. So they either get a yellow or a green, depending on a survey or an interview. And when they do five activities with me, I will put a crown above their head. So they will be my UX champions. We are, no. Um, so I think getting people excited is also really helpful in establishing a research cult culture. Ultimately, this presentation was also about how can you start a culture. So these things can happen. If you're an introvert, um, it's not necessary that you have to do these things, but just figure out your own way of evangelizing research. Right? I don't think we are at a stage where we can say only people who have personality traits A, B, C can make it good into UX research or designer. And as we saw the panelists yesterday, they said, you actually don't need any degree to be in UX. All you need is an inquisitive mind, right? And openness to learn. And that's all you need. So that's it.
I didn't get to uh, recap, but I think the slides will be available so you can have your seven steps. Um, so questions, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active. I post regularly so we can connect there. Quick word. We saw some wonderful sketching happening at our event. Oh, my Q&A, yes. Oh, there are questions, wow. Okay, let me just take two quickly. Can we? Too late. Yay, okay. Uh, all of them are one word. Eeny, meeny, miny, How to get users to plot customer journey map when they have a it depends journey. Example, account manager's day of life. Hmm. How to get users to plot customer journey map when they have a it depends journey. Just map your it depends. You need to put that it depends, like that it needs to be on your map. That's the shortest answer I can give you. When will you use quantitative and when will you use a qualitative research? What do you prefer? I am a big fan of mixed method research and that's probably because of my training being in academia. I think one, each approach has its own uh, benefit and I think people who do ethnographic research, I really, my heart goes out to you because it's really painful and it's a lot of hard work. So you should have respect for people who do ethnographic research day in and day out. But I think we have data and data has power right and it has intelligence so we should be using both so what i do is i use a mixed method approach and i try to corroborate both quantitative and qualitative results with each other to make sure that i'm reaching a single source of truth and i'm not wandering in like data says this and my user says this um, is it important for a ux designer to be good at research okay this one is a bit tricky designers also have their own research practices right but it just looks a bit different because as a UX researcher, I'm focused on bringing my customer's voice to the team. That's, that's my sole focus. Whereas a design can, designer can get into user research as well, but they can also do design specific research, right? So I, I, I don't know what actually are the parameters that they definitely look at, but I know from personal experience that designers do their own kind of research. And I think it's mostly related to design um, philosophies or design trends or I don't know whatever designers do so they have their own research and user research is basically more customers focused but to this question I don't think it's a rule that a designer cannot be um, a user researcher I think you can be both and it, you're an asset if you if you can do both uh, how okay Quan or call what to focus on first I believe that you can go from quant to qual much faster than qual to quant, right? Quant gives you an immediate uh, data back to the direction, which you can then verify with your qual data. So the journey is faster, but you can also do it the other way. It depends on, on, on the research question. Um, how do you measure the caliber or success of a UX researcher? I mean, I think it draws back to the point of which matrix you want to contribute to. Are you an ROI person? Are you a customer, customer satisfaction person? So whatever metrics you want to contribute to, if you've shown an improvement in that, I think you're successful. And another way of measuring successful is also if you change the mindset of senior stakeholders. If you start hearing the word research, UX, UX research, wait, let's do research, wait, let's get data. You've already changed the mindset of team. They it's, and it's addictive, research is addictive. Once you know that there's a way to get to a more confident place where you can make decisions, you will always want to do that, right? I think that's all we have time for. Um, I really wanted to showcase the wonderful, and you can find me, um, send me an email and I will answer all I your questions. I think we can take like one question from the floor maybe. From the floor, oh yeah, yeah true. Yeah. Any burning questions from the floor? Okay. Do you guys, um, so when it comes to user research, it tends to, be sort of within the UX team mostly who owns it but when you have to share it with other teams is there any central place that you put it that it's easier to share your research or a way for them to access it back when you don't have to guide them through it? Yeah, I mean that's a good question how do you communicate and research is as effective as it's communicated so I make sure that communication is happening at all times and as quickly as possible. And yes, of course, there's a central place where all so-called decks or reports, whatever has been generated out of the research projects goes and sits and anyone who wants to access it can access it. But I feel like, and this is again data bagged, if it doesn't really matter for your KPI for that quarter, 
nobody's opening that report or that deck, right? All they want to is find that one easy digestible format, just tell me, and I will go and make that decision because people are just busy, right? Um, so yeah, finding an effective communication methodology is up to you. How does your team want to communicate? Do they want to read reports or do they want to actually get in a room for like 45 minutes every week and then figure out what outcomes that research has led or that research project has led? So that is more like field basis. Uh, but I think there is huge value in documenting everything that you do because research doesn't happen in, in silos, right? It needs to feed. So. Yeah, keep documenting it so that a new hire or a new joinee can really read that, go through it, and figure out and be onboarded much faster rather than you walking them through all the projects that, has, that have happened. Okay. Sorry, last question. So as, as you collect all this uh, uh, history of whatever research you've done, does it help to sort of map out where you've come with the research in terms of that particular product that you're developing, do you do it annually or does it help to do it? Uh, just to give you a holistic view of like, do we need to do more in certain areas versus not? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so again, uh, it depends. We generally do like small asks for research like contextual inquiry or mid-sized projects would take about two to three weeks, um, uh, usability testing, designing prototypes, testing them out with uh, remote users or live users. We do a lot of live usability testing at MoneySmart. And then the final one is, um, so small, mid, and then large, something that runs across six months, like big asks and big projects, complete revamps of uh, projects, replatforming of projects. Um, so of course, tracking is important. You have to go back and see whether that project um, delivered something that was measurable, right? Measuring is important. And you will only know whether it worked if you measured it. So um, the short answer is yes, we do measure it, go back, look at the mistakes that we did, things that worked out. Uh, but more importantly, we learn that we have to embed our metrics in our research projects, otherwise we'll never know whether it worked, right? And those metrics are dependent on the research question that you're answering. Okay, any more burning questions? Okay, we'll connect later. Um, so these are like some wonderful sketches that I saw of um, some young designers that are in the room. So I actually want them to come up if you see your, your design on, um, on the projector. Let's see if we can figure out who they are. Katrin, you're here. So there's a little sketch for you when you were doing your talk. Um, can I have... Rinalini up on the stage. Can we give her a, a, a round of applause for those wonderful sketches? Um, there's Ilkar and is Mitushi here? I don't, is Mitushi here? No. Um, okay, Rinalini, can you tell us how did you get into design and how does sketching help you in uh, making more out of, let's say, a talk? Hi, everyone. First of all, I want to thank Anu to invite me over for this conference. It was a really um, great break from my routine at work. Yeah, just sitting in front of the computer the whole day. Yeah, so um, I got into design. Um, I went to design school at NID. So I think that's when I got into design as such. But my passion for drawing, etc., started like when I was probably eight or 10. So I started doodling at a very young age and yeah, it just my mom spotted this and she sent me to design school. Yeah, so that's how it started. And um, I think it really helps me listen. So um, through the conference, I, I was making small doodles. And um, when I look back at these, I probably, if it was just notes, I probably wouldn't look at it. I would just throw it away. So these doodles will help me read through the notes. So yeah, that was it. Thank you. Is Aditi here? Aditi from uh, Ruffle, Ruffle Candy? No, okay. Um, we have another uh, beautiful sketcher. She's not here, she was here yesterday. If you are here, please get up. No, I think. Um, her name is Pramiti and she did some wonderful sketches, but her approach was quite different. So as you see, I'm a researcher at heart. I was collecting data and then seeing patterns. Like this person really thinks differently because she did individual talks, whereas for Minalini, it was more like what were the more like broader learnings from, from that one, and a, one hour talk. So 
Um, there's one for Prakriti, Aditi, and she has like, I think she did the whole day one. Um, so everyone who presented on day one got lucky. We have Gideon. Gideon, you're here. Uh, pretty simplistic. <laughs> we have... <laughs> and for Caitlin, I think she got the bangs, right? <laughs> um, so you can actually go to her Instagram handle, which is uh, Pramiti S. Um, just say a quick word of thanks to her or ask her for the sketch if you want. Um, is oh another giddy, oh no okay and finally some activity also on linkedin we've had people making notes and then putting them up is wayman cow here oh she's here welcome okay um can you introduce yourself what you do and what's your process of coming up with these sketches uh hi my name is wayman i'm a product designer at pivotal um so um the process of coming up with this actually you need to, i was i had to listen very closely because I was only trying to write down all the things that were relevant to the topic and sometimes I summarized some of the points so I wasn't trying to just write down everything that was on the PowerPoint for example. So it's a lot of active listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so active listening. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's about it. That's a wrap for us. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience for the last three days and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.